Hello, everyone. Good morning to those joining us from the U.S. or Canada and parts of Latin America, and good afternoon or good evening to those joining us from overseas. My name is Laia Greeno, and I manage Interactions Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group. Interaction is the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs with nearly 200 member organizations, including the two organizations you'll be hearing from today, Mercy Corps and AfriCare. Um, this is the, the fourth webinar in a series of impact evaluation webinars that Interaction is developing with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation and which are meant to accompany a four-part impact evaluation guidance note series. We're very pleased to have John Kurtz, Senior Technical Advisor for Research and Evaluation at Mercy Corps, and Celeste Lemro, Director for Monitoring and Evaluation at AfriCare, presenting today. Um, their presentations are intended as a complement to the webinar with Bert Perrin last week on the second guidance note in the series, linking monitoring and evaluation to impact evaluation. So John and Celeste's presentations today will provide specific examples of different ways in which their organizations have used m &E to inform impact evaluation, which will be very helpful to everyone listening in, I'm sure. Um, so I'm just going to start our session today with a short background on the series, and then we'll be turning it over to John and Celeste for their presentations. We'll save all the questions until the end, and as you, you'll see, we've extended the webinar slightly to make sure we have enough time for q and I'll then wrap things up and let you know what's coming next. So as those who've joined us for past webinars know, the purpose of this four-part guidance note series is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high-quality impact evaluation. The four notes in the series are Introduction to Impact Evaluation by Patricia Rogers, Professor in Public Sector Evaluation at RMIT University in Australia, Linking Monitoring and Evaluation to Impact Evaluation by Bert Perrin, who's an independent consultant, Introduction to Mixed Methods for Impact Evaluation by Michael Bamberger, also an independent consultant, and Use of Impact Evaluation Results by David Bonbright, who's Chief Executive of Keystone Accountability in the UK. While the series is targeted at NGO staff in particular, the notes and series of webinars will be useful to staff and other types of organizations as well. Um, the notes are just 20 to 30 pages in length, so they're really just meant as an introductory resource on these topics, raising the issues that those involved in impact evaluation should be thinking about, providing some guidance, and pointing people to additional resources. Um, and our hope, like I said, is that they'll lead to better quality impact evaluation. Um, and just one note that the notes will also be translated into Spanish, French, and Arabic. So each webinar in the series will be accompanied by two webinars, one more theoretical, the other more focused on actual practice. In March, we launched the first guidance note with a webinar in which Patricia Rogers presented an overview of her note, Introduction to Impact Evaluation, and we followed that with a webinar featuring presentations from Allison Davis of Oxfam America, who focused on an impact evaluation of a program to prevent gender-based violence in El Salvador as well as from Mulu Chekel and Larry Dershem of Save the Children, who presented some brief case studies of impact evaluations conducted in Palestine and Kazakhstan. Um, and last week, as I mentioned, Bert presented an overview of the second note in the series. So today we'll, we'll be hearing about how organizations are actually applying some of the concepts and ideas that Bert presented in his note. Um, so the notes, along with the recordings and presentations from the webinars, will be posted on Interaction's website as they are developed at the link you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, as you can see, the first guidance notes and materials from the two webinars associated with that note um, have already been posted. For those who submitted questions um, to, for Patricia's webinars, the answers to those questions have also been posted on the site as well, um, and the first note and webinar from the and webinar recording from Bert's webinar are up on there as well. Um, so just one last thing before I turn it over to to John, just want to let you know a little bit about the technology today. Um, if you want to minimize or maximize this webinar screen, um, you can just click on the orange arrow. 
You can view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking on the blue box below that. Um, due to the large number of participants, you actually don't have the ability to raise the hand feature, but if, and, and you'll be on mute for the whole webinar. But if you have a question, please type it into the question box. Um, I'll be monitoring questions throughout um, the presentation, so please send those questions to me as you think of them, and that way we'll be able to move into the Q&A right away. Um, and so with that, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Laya, and thanks, everybody, for joining. The presentation I'd like to share today was is really building on one of the key points that, that Bert put in his guidance note and, and touched on in his PowerPoint last week, um, and that is starting with what we have. And by this, the premise is that there's a lot of existing data out there, uh, both from our program M&E as well as other sources, that, that we can really leverage um, as part of our impact evaluation efforts. So I wanted to, to provide an example of, of how Mercy Corps has done this through uh, a recent impact evaluation of a multi-country youth civic engagement program. And just to say up front that most of what we're doing is, is building on the ideas of other evaluation practitioners, um, you know, at times I think maybe perverting them vastly. But nonetheless, um, I'll try to give some references to where these ideas come from and you might be able to uh, find a better articulated and more genuine presentation of them there. Mercy Corps' approach to impact evaluation is, is really trying to focus our limited resources on, on evaluation programs through which we can test some broader theories of change. Um, so less about trying to answer the question of did a particular program work uh, in a given context uh, at a particular time, but rather choosing programs that we feel are indicative of, of our approach um, around a certain social challenge. Um, and ones that provide an opportunity for some broader, more transferable learning. So the, the Youth Civic Engagement Program that, that I'll be talking about today is, is a program like that. Um, one that we feel like is a, there's a lot of questions and debates around what works in this area um, and what difference it makes. So for us, it's a, um, it's a strategic choice of, of where we decide to take on impact evaluations. And the, the uh, I think a good source to, for sort of more information on this approach to rigorous impact evaluation um, is Chris, Chris Blavin's work, and um, particular a presentation he gave at DFID last year with, with a link there below if you want to um, get a, a very articulate scoop on that. So Mercy Corps, like most of your agencies, probably faces you know uh, similar challenges around pulling off good impact evaluations. Um, you know, one are resource limitations. I think those are a given. Um, the other for us is what I think of sometimes is just a lack of foresight. Um, we often come to the end of a program and at that point are keen on uh, digging deeper, um, applying a you know, rigorous evaluation method to be able to understand um, impacts. And, you know, that's... Uh, present some particular challenges around uh, doing a solid impact evaluation. So one thing that we found assists with both of those challenges is to really maximize the use of, of, of existing data. Um, and in particular, I will walk you through how we used it for you know, three different approaches that contribute, contributed to the impact evaluation of the, of the youth civic engagement program I'm uh, referring to. The first method was uh, what we're calling a plausibility assessment, really to determine if an impact evaluation uh, in a fuller form was warranted and where to focus that. The second is um, using existing data for generating a relative counterfactual amongst the, at least the population that did participate uh, within the program. And then the last, uh, using some existing data for um, coming up with a strong match design, uh, again, at, a, at an evaluation that was planned towards the end of a project. For each of these, I'll, I'll give an overview of, of the approach or the method and then go into how we applied it. So the plausibility assessment is really 
again, um, you know, before even doing primary data collection, just taking stock of what's there uh, to get a sense of are the, the theories that the program is based on um, you know, grounded in um, strong logic? Um, are they supported by other studies that have looked at the links between those uh, in order to be able to say, is it, is it really necessary and a good idea to invest in more primary data collection around those as part of the program? There's a lot of ways to approach plausibility assessments. Um, there are uh, some good sources out there being accumulated, um, you know, in terms of other impact evaluations, uh, some systematic reviews that uh, groups like IIIE are, um, are starting to, and those are, you know, a, for me, a, a real first go-to source to see what else has been studied around um, programs or similar, that have similar theories or, um, or, or, you know, hypotheses. Uh, the other method that we've been using more in Mercy Corps is to uh, do our own analysis of existing, often secondary data, to be able to, to test those links within the broader population that we're the, that we're targeting within a program. So, you know, some of those sources um, I'll, I'll mention the ones we use as part of the Youth Civic Engagement Impact Evaluation, uh, but these are often national surveys, cross-national surveys um, with obviously you know, measures that are relevant to the outcomes that you're working on within the program. So in our case, uh, the first step was okay. Please call 5300. gather a, um, a, a theory of change around the outcomes of, of, this, of this use of engagement program. Uh, and this reflects generally the outcomes that you know, we, we had expected to see, and then operationalizing those variables into, you know, specific uh, measures. So, for example, if we're looking at changes around levels of social capital amongst youth, um, for us, that those were things like shared social identity, uh, tolerance, et cetera. And then, you know, once we pin that down, it's going out and looking for uh, data sources, data sets that have measures of those variables in them. And for we were looking at these questions within the context of, of youth in the Middle East, and we're able to find a few sources that that did have good recent data on this. Uh, one was Arab Barometer surveys, which were uh, a multi-country survey around uh, perceptions of governance and civic engagement. Um, and there was a number of other country-specific studies that we also used uh, or pulled data to analyze from. Some of the other sources that are um, you know, out there that I often sort of look to are things like world value surveys, uh, DHS data is, is good for testing, you know, certain uh, hypotheses that, that underlie our programs, uh, similar to those. So in this case, the, um, the, the analyses that we do with that data are essentially hypothesis testing um, using, you know, different statistical tests depending on the nature of the data. Uh, to look at, you know, do changes in, for example, the status of young people's civic engagement, for example, uh, their uh, participation in community service or volunteer activities, um, when that changes, does uh, do do we see similar changes to the outcomes that we're hoping? And and what we found here uh, is is highlighted by the the arrows, which show where we we did find. Um, you know, strong correlations or associations between between these variables. So in this case, what, what we came away with understanding is that, um, for example, around the social capital outcomes, it's really not likely to expect that a change in civic engagement status uh, is going to make much difference to changes in, in the measures of social capital that we that we looked at. Um, so that that theory is less plausible than some of the others we came away with understanding, at least in this population. Um, whereas others, you know, showed stronger linkages. So, for example, um, engagement in, in a political form of youth, in, for example, protesting or demonstrating, uh, was pretty strongly linked to uh, levels of economic engagement. <clears throat> so that's something that, you know, helped inform where we would dig deeper with primary data collection. The second approach that, that we use as part of this impact evaluation, building on secondary data, um, or, or existing data rather, 
was to construct a, what, what's being called a relative counterfactual. Um, and this is a, a, a concept that I saw Rick Davies um, you know, talk about. And um, <laughs> for me, it's always nice when, when someone like Rick Davies is, um, is coining a term uh, around something that we're already doing. I think it gives, for me at least, an instant sort of credibility boost to our methods. So in this case, what um, the purpose is, is to, is to look at the relationships between an intervention itself uh, and the expected outcomes. Bert uh, talked quite a bit about this last week as well, trying to get a, a real sense of the intervention, how it varies amongst the, the population being engaged or targeted. Um, and, and the relative counterfactual, what it's doing is trying to link things like levels of participation, levels of exposure in a program, um, to the changes we want to see or expect to see. So again, it's, it's based mostly on correlational analysis, um, using measures of the intervention, either the quality of the intervention, the intensity of exposure or participation in the intervention, um, and again, the, the outcomes that we're looking at. The, the source of, of, of data for doing this um, you know, is program implementation data. And from my experience, it, it comes from, it's often available in, in two different forms. One is just from our routine monitoring and evaluation that's ongoing over the life of a program. Uh, in other cases, I've seen it necessary to gather data on individuals, for example, participation in a program as part of, a, of an inline survey um, if, if it's not available from, from ongoing M&E. For, for our own application of it, we actually used um, implementation data from both sources, our, our ongoing m and &E as well as um, from, from the survey we conducted in the end line. And the, and the steps to this, producing a relative counterfactual, uh, as, as we've used it, are basically as follows. Um, one is just gathering relevant you know, program implementation data. And here's some examples uh, that, that we found uh, of that, you know, length of participation in, in the program, which in this case is called Global Citizens Corps, uh, different activities and the frequency of participation in different activities of the program, uh, exposure or interaction with program staff, uh, and the intensity or frequency of that. These are all things that, you know, in this case, were being collected on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> the, the key to being able to draw links between levels of, of, of those implementation measures and, and the outcomes that we're seeking are, is really being able to, to, to have direct links between them at the unit that we're analyzing and measuring. So I've seen you know, many cases where you know, programs are doing a great job with you know, our, our routine M&E. So basically what kind of, you know, data that we might see under this participation tracker heading here. Uh, and doing a great job with, with uh, measuring outcomes, you know, baseline, inline measures. But the, the links between them are not there, so it's difficult to show any congruency between uh, greater participation in the program, for example, and uh, more impact on uh, an outcome like self-efficacy. So simple ways of doing that are having you know, unique identifiers. If, uh, if we are tracking you know, all participants of a program, um, and including those in, in, in both M and E data collection as well as um, you know more more of the evaluation moments, and the other is is again building in some of the participation data into uh, the survey where you're also collecting uh, outcome data so that you can do that uh, um, dual level analyses of those together and see how they they link. So for us, uh, we had an example of trying to look at does the exposure to or interaction with, with program staff among youth or youth groups as part of this program uh, make a difference to their um, changes in their self-confidence. And here, we, our hypothesis was that we would expect the confidence to be higher for, for daily and weekly interaction than it would have been for bi-weekly interaction. In this case, we didn't find uh, any significant associations between you know, two, um, these two factors. 
there was other analyses that we did that did show them, but, but the idea here is that you are trying to, based on the, the variance within the participation in a program um, or other measures of implementation, see what difference that makes to uh, the outcomes that we're looking at. And a, a slight aside here, but I think an important point to make these types of analyses possible is to the extent possible, building in um, more continuous variables into our um, into our M and E. So, for example, um, a a confidence scale that is based on several questions that get at aspects of of self confidence. Um, often, what we see in 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 our surveys are much more categorical data, um, sort of dichotomous questions around, you know, yes, no. Um, did all the children in the, in the household sleep under a mosquito net last night? Uh, and those are solid survey questions, but the, that type of categorical data doesn't lend itself to uh, some of the analyses uh, that help us make stronger inferences about the degree of change um, on, let's say, a scale and, um, and the extent of their participation or exposure in a program. So that's just, just one, one to highlight where I think, as Mercy Corps, we're we're striving to, to do more. The last way we, we went about using existing data as part of this impact evaluation was um, as the basis for a, uh, a matched design. And at this point, we, we had done our plausibility assessment. Um, we had you know, from that come away with a good sense of where we're likely to see our theory holding up um, and where we wanted to focus the impact evaluation and primary data collection. We also uh, had inbuilt measures of the program participation and implementation so that we could generate this relative counterfactual. But there was still a, a need and to some extent probably a demand, um, as many of us feel, for a more, a more pure counterfactual. Uh, but here we are at the end of the program, and you know, struggling to figure out how do we how do we come up with that uh, at this point. So this is where match designs often um, can be helpful. They can be used at, at an ex post evaluation stage, um, and basically are a way to construct a comparison group using some statistical procedures um, to be able to have participants, a group of, of non-participants as similar in as many ways as possible to, uh, to those who did participate in the program. Um, propensity score matching is one that uh, is, is, is a matching method that uh, I think is pretty well accepted and, um, and used quite often these days. We, we use that in this case um, as well as some, some more conventional matching. There's a Good IADB uh, guidance note on propensity score matching for people who are interested in more details on that. Uh, I won't go into uh, the, the technical side of that, but more um, how we use existing data to be able to support a strong match design in this case. The, the sources for being able to come up with a, um, a comparison group based on matching are, are often two. Uh, one is, is just oversampling of the population of interest, and in particular in, including um, measures in there that can help us make good matches. Uh, and I'll go through a few of those um, in the next slide of, of the types of variables we included to do that. The other form of, of data that I think is under, under maybe recognized for this is, is data from, from applications of, in this case, youth, for example, who are applying to the program but didn't get in for, for a lack of space. Uh, I think there's a number of types of programs where I see us having that data um, but not using it. So small grants program where, let's say, youth groups or other groups are, are applying, um, but we have you know, a limited number of, uh, of grants we can distribute. Those are really rich sources for being able to match groups, um, mainly because they 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 help overcome some of the self-selection bias that, that, uh, that these programs are prone to. Um, any program where, you, where people are volunteering in, um, it automatically makes them you know, different in many ways um, from, from people who don't uh, apply. So, but, but these are things that are difficult to measure and match on. So 
levels of motivation or innate abilities. So when we're taking data from uh, or carving out a comparison group from from applicants, we we feel you know a bit more confident that they're similar in some of these some of these unobservable ways to to those pro, uh, youth who, who were in the program. So we used uh, both youth applicant data uh, to do some conventional matching at first, and you know basic socio-demographic data um, are, are often uh, ways to match. Um, we also had some, some application data on their past engagement in similar activities that the program was working on uh, that we used. And then we felt like some additional data was needed to be able to do um, you know, a, a really good job matching. And so we included uh, data in the in the inline survey for both the the participant youth and then that subset of youth that were uh, the comparison. Uh, and we included some additional socio-demographic data and um, and uh, and other variables that uh, with propensity score matching, you, you can essentially create a composite score of their likelihood to have participated in the program. So all of those forms helped us to come away with uh, a comparison group from which we could say something about you know, what would have happened without, um, without the program, which is the kind of the, the aim of, of impact evaluations as we, as we now know it. So just to summarize, for us, we really see this, um, this sort of growing amount of, of existing data from both our program m and &E, as well as a lot of other sources that, um, that can really be tapped and, and help us um, you know, maximize the use of our, of our limited impact evaluation resources. Um, and by using secondary sources especially, we found that we can uh, you know, of, of minimize the, the demands on program staff uh, that go along with a lot of the heavy data, primary data collection that's often um, a part of these rigorous impact evaluations. And, the, and the, the three ways that we're really trying to do this that are, in my mind, doable and short of the, you know, experimental designs, even the quasi-experimental designs that are, you know, some oftentimes quite difficult for a lot of our agencies to pull off. The ways that we're, that we're sort of supplementing that are, one, exploiting secondary sources uh, in existing studies. Two is to build in this implementation data, um, especially at, at outcome surveys, so that we are, you know, again, able to, to generate a, a relative counterfactual at a minimum. And as part of that, uh, building in more, more continuous variables to be able to do um, some stronger statistical analyses and tests to show uh, you know, real differences between levels of our participation, quality of program implementation, um, and, the, and the outcomes we're seeking. So thanks very much. That's it from my side, and I'll turn it back over to, to Laia. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, I think you've given us lots to think about. And Celeste, I'm just going to switch it to you now. Um, just go straight into your presentation so then we could have Q&A. And thanks for those who've submitted questions so far. Um, we'll, we'll get to those at the end, and if you have questions, um, again, please do send them, send them to me as they come to you. Uh, okay, uh, should I go ahead and start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so as Lai mentioned, my name is Celeste Lemro, and I am the Director of Monitoring and Evaluation for AfriCare. Uh, we're an NGO that focuses on development work in Africa, obviously, uh, and we focus largely on food security, health, and water and sanitation. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about kind of how we tried to link uh, monitoring and evaluation with impact evaluation through a project we did in Ghana uh, on water and sanitation. Um, just to start, uh, I'll give a brief overview of the project. This was actually a very small project um, in eight communities in western Ghana in the Wasa Menfi Di District. Uh, we uh, basically were trying, the goal was to sort of look at uh, a behavior change, a communication approach that AfriCare had been developing around sanitation uh, based on the, the concept of community-led total sanitation, uh, focusing on sort of community-driven behavior change uh, with uh, traditional sort of water and sanitation hardware, in this case, 
um, improve community water sources, namely wells and boreholes, um, institutional latrines, the implementation of or the installation of latrines in schools and health facilities, um, particularly schools where uh, latrines were needed for uh, girls, and um, the encouragement of of the uh, purchase by households of latrines uh, for their own use through sanitation markets where uh, local artisans are trained in building uh, latrines and other sanitation projects uh, for purchase by households. So both the training component for them to develop them and then the encouragement of households about the advantages of, of purchasing those. Um, and then it was compared to basically behavior change only. So the question was whether um, the combined uh, impact of essentially kind of hardware and software, so to speak, with sort of the behavior change only um, made any sort of significant difference. Um, and so in terms of the, the motivation for the evaluation, I think this, uh, Africare was well poised to, to be more thoughtful than maybe um, had been in previous projects around uh, the linking of M&E and evaluation in this case. Um, first, because of the there was a particular institutional interest in assessing the effectiveness of this approach um, for two reasons. Um, one, the money for this project actually came from President Obama. We have him to thank for this um, because he uh, donated a portion of his Nobel Prize to Africare, and it was decided that the money would would go for this project. So there was a, um, a kind of a, a sense of importance around it that uh, strengthened the commitment to impact and then impact evaluation. And then also there was a particular interest in, uh, in scale-up, um, potentially based on what the results were. Um, and then similarly, uh, it was also viewed as a good discrete opportunity to really think harder uh, as an institution about incorporating monitoring and evaluation uh, and impact evaluation into, into all points of the project life cycle. So the, the scope of the project was, uh, in some ways, a good size for um, trying to incorporate that better uh, into these things. Uh, so the first area where um, we were able to kind of link m and &E with impact evaluation was at the design and, and launch phase. Um, and in particular, we had it wasn't a large survey, but we did have a baseline survey um, that sampled households both in sort of the, the key treatment and then comparison groups um, that try to incorporate collecting data that would be useful both for program monitoring as well as the impact evaluation. Um, and in particular, uh, it focused on uh, knowledge of sanitation practices and, uh, and knowledge of ways to prevent waterborne diseases. And this baseline data helped to inform uh, the implementation of the behavior change campaign. And it also looked uh, at sort of the status of access of households to water sources and latrines, which uh, helped to shape the, the hardware component and to know, it provided some good baseline data to know how better to monitor that over the life of the program and what would be useful to track. Um, and then there was an m and &E plan for this project that included many of the traditional indicators for monitoring purposes, you know, number of wells installed, number of latrines installed, number of people trained, um, but also tried to incorporate at the monitoring level, not just the survey, some of the information that would provide the context for the impact evaluation. Um, and, and in particular, it looked at um, uh, tracking communities uh, to be declared as having open defecation free status. So that was an assessment that took place, it was a sort of a key impact element of the project, but it took place in the monitoring component rather than the baseline and end line survey. So that was another way that um, trying to, to merge the two was incorporated. Um, and so then in terms of the how monitoring data helped to shape the evaluation, there were a few things that came to light over the course of the program that helped um, to shape where the impact evaluation went at the end of the project and how it was maybe different than what was originally envisioned. Um, the first was that uh, the reporting on the number of latrines constructed in the household 
was really key to sort of, it was a key monitoring indicator that helped to demonstrate what we might have been seeing around demand for latrines based on the work of training the artisans and sort of setting up these sanitation markets. I mean, in particular, it, it suggested a potentially really strong demand um, based on the number of latrines built, um, higher than I think uh, might have initially had been anticipated. And so that became uh, a key element of, of where we looked in the final evaluation. And because of that, we were able to sort of use the survey to, to measure a 30% increase in latrine installation in the treatment group. Um, we saw a 6% increase in the comparison group, which obviously is much lower. This group did receive encouragement to as install latrines as part of the BCC component, but not as much at, um, not without the I think the additional hardware and other elements that came with the with the more intensive form of implement uh, implementation that's where some of this difference came um, another key thing uh, where the monitoring data combined with to see sort of field reports and sort of what were people involved with the project on the ground sort of noticing uh, were also really important to shaping the evaluation. Um, perhaps the biggest area was that when this evaluation was initially conceptualized, it was um, felt that uh, at the project start, the, um, the prevalence of diarrhea in children under five would be the key variable, a very traditional thing to look at in a water and sanitation program. Um, this was going to be the focus. Um, but by the end of the program, it became clear that um, the available uh, information suggested that actually latrine take up and behavior change were perhaps more important to look at. Um, and that also the change in disease prevalence, kind of based on what people were seeing on the ground and sort of what was going on in the communities, might not be as promising. And so it would be really important to see what else we needed to look at if we if we didn't see the change that we were expecting to see around um, prevalence of diarrhea. And that, was, that actually turned out to be really valuable uh, information because in the end when we had our final survey, we did in fact not see significant change in the diarrhea prevalence, but other variables had substantial change. Um, so because of the, this sort of sense of what was going on on the ground, um, the endline, we added some additional questions to the endline survey related to sanitation behavior at the community and household level. Um, we certainly recognize that it's always better to be able to anticipate everything up front so you have it in both your baseline and your endline. But in this case, we felt it was worthwhile to add these additional questions to at least try to capture some of the differences that we might not um, have been able to otherwise if we kept the survey exactly the same. Um, and in particular areas where we added questions, there were, there were always some questions in the baseline as well, but where we fleshed it out a little bit more, um, was looking at management of stagnant water and waste um, because there had been sort of evidence from the monitoring component that the community efforts, this was a community level kind of assessment in the survey, and that these efforts had really seen some substantial change. Um, we added a lot more questions about, some, some more questions about sort of appropriate defecation practices and how the community was managing that um, and what kinds of norms it was trying to institute based on the behavior change component. Uh, we've, based on the, what we both learned in terms of how well the baseline survey worked and then what we were seeing, we, we not so much added but revised some questions around hand washing practices to try to get more specific information about what was going on with that. Um, so that was a case of learning from both the baseline and the program monitoring. Uh, we added some, some more specific questions either in terms of potential responses and framing around the disposal of children's feces. Um, and we added questions around the management of household water source. Uh, and this was for a couple reasons. One, we noticed through sort of the field monitoring that um, we needed to re really look at that closely because there were, were, there were some almost sort of contradictory things going on there where on the one hand, people were, seemed to be hearing the messages about the importance of storing water in a container and treating water. On the other hand, there was a very strong uh, sort of just 
I guess, sort of community level belief that if you got your water from a well rather than from the river, that was automatically safer and you didn't need to treat that water. And so we had sort of some uh, kind of uh, contradictory factors going on in the community that we needed to tease out. So we sort of addressed, uh, tried to revise the questions and add a couple questions to sort of tease that out. And it, it turned out to be very helpful because we did learn that, in fact, um, it, some, in some cases, the, the fact that, that a community or household had better access to a well was very important, but that affected how they were adopting some of the other behavior change messages and, and tactics that were being imparted to the community. So that, that turned out to be worthwhile. Um, so some of the, the key results that we got that um, turned out to be aligned with what we had sort of seen from kind of field level reporting um, were that we did see a 9% reported increase in improved hand washing techniques, which aligned with sort of what we were seeing. So it was, it was helpful to have that confirmed in the endline survey. Um, as mentioned previously, we saw a 30% increase in installed latrines. This was probably one of the biggest changes that we saw through the evaluation and, and through the program monitoring. Um, so again, it's you know what, what we saw as sort of most significant wasn't what we thought was going to be the key variable at the start. Um, and in fact, uh, on the diarrhea prevalence, uh, we we, we saw no positive change. It was actually a slight reported increase in prevalence. Um, and that was not unexpected, um, we, though we don't have as much context for that as we would like. And I will um, talk about that kind of in the next, uh, next slide, um, which is what we would have done differently if we've had, we had had the guidance note. Um, because I think it was it was really helpful to to look at that and then look back at what we had done and see where we uh, aligned with those recommendations and then where, based on sort of the information in that, we might do something differently in a in a case like this. Um, one is that we would uh, I think we would have more monitoring indicators to support the evaluation. I think there was a good effort made to to link the monitoring framework with the evaluation, but um, Kind of moving forward, definitely trying to be more explicit about that, and some t and in some cases maybe even having a few more metrics um, would would be helpful. Um, and then in in the case of this particular project, having some more mo having the monitoring framework look more around behavior change and what's going on with the the sanitation markets and the behavior change campaign, I think would have been helpful. We probably relied too much on the survey component for that, and we could have done more over the course of program monitoring to have uh, some more rigorous information from that as well to feed into the evaluation. Um, another thing that I think would be good to do, especially when you're trying to link M&E and, and impact evaluation, is having one or two focus group exercises during the project. May, this was a short project, so maybe even more than that for a longer term project. But to focus group exercises to provide the, some of that context that, again, because um, you know, we maybe thought we would get more than was realistic out of the baseline and endline survey would have helped to provide some additional information in a more um, organized way besides the field reports from the project staff on the ground, which were very useful and important, but having this I think would have been helpful, particularly around the disease prevalence issue where we didn't quite get what we, what we needed to, to totally um, figure that out. Um, and then I think we would also have done a midterm review with the impact evaluation in mind um, to start thinking a little bit earlier about how what we see going on in the M&E framework and the program monitoring is going to frame the final directions of the impact evaluation. When we did sort of do that stock taking, it was um, much towards the end, and I think we would have benefited maybe from starting that a little bit earlier. Um, so definitely a lot of good lessons learned about what worked well with linking M&E and impact evaluation, but also where we want to go more in the future. Uh, and so I think that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Celeste. Um, just a reminder to, to everyone who has um, questions. Um, like I said at the, at the beginning of the presentation,
presentation or just before the presentation started, if you have a question, please do type it into the question box right here. Um, so we, we already have a, a few questions. Um, the first couple are for, for John. Um, and John, the question is, um, is plausibility assessment the standard term used to describe, in a sense, a needs assessment for whether to do an impact evaluation at all? Or is this something that um, Mercy Corps usually always does in determining whether to conduct an impact evaluation? And then the second question is, how are you able to measure the independent variables, especially the program effect using the barometer survey, which is not a panel study, and how did you measure outcomes for political violence, which should be a composite index variable? So hopefully you can take both of those. John, are you there? Yeah, how about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Sure. Okay, the first question, plausibility assessment, I've seen it come, you know, under some different headings, um, <clears throat> logic checks. Um, I, I think more than a needs assessment, it's um, maybe part of an evaluability assessment, um, which I guess you're describing as a needs assessment to do an impact evaluation. Uh, I, I don't think it gives a kind of a, a, a yes-no answer to, to that question. I think it's more of which pieces of an impact evaluation are most likely to be, um, to be fruitful. <clears throat> and then the, the second question about um, measuring independent variables. So on, with the plausibility assessment and the secondary data analysis, this is um, really saying nothing about the program at all. This is a a cross-sectional survey um, of the youth population of interest to the program. So in this case, we're simply looking at the differences in, in the status of the independent variables. So for example, there were measures of, of, of different forms of civic engagement. And we can see based on you know, individual status on those, how that links to uh, the outcomes that we're looking for in the program. So if um, if electoral behavior, you know, the, the extent to which um, or, or whether or not young people have voted in a recent election um, or got together with others to, to sort of raise an issue to a local government official, um, you know, do, does their status on, on those activities uh, make a difference to their, for example, views towards, um, you know, use of political violence? So it's simply a correlation and, and it's based on the, the overall population that we're we're, we're working with, <clears throat> and again, it's just giving us a sense of you know if we're if we're barking up the right tree with these kinds of hypotheses. Uh, the second part of the question is how do we measure political violence? Uh, yes, uh, you know that's definitely something that I, in an ideal world would be um, you know a composite variable. Um, with these kinds of analyses, I often have them as um, using a kind of a Donald Rumsfeld uh, quote, which is you. you you come to these analyses with the data that you have, not the data that you'd like to have. So, um, you know, in this case, there are some some measures around attitudes and behaviors of political violence, um, but they were mostly uh, categorical. Great. Um, and actually, just to follow up to the first uh, question about plausibility assessments, do you use that um, plausibility assessment more for hypothesis testing or to generate hypotheses to test? Um, for us, it's been mostly confirmatory, so testing the hypotheses. Um, in a few cases, we will throw variables in there um, to see whether or not they come, and, and that helps us to generate new hypotheses in some cases. Um, you know, a variable around uh, social cohesion um, that we may not be working on directly, but we want to see if that makes a difference to um, you know, again, sort of attitudes towards political violence, let's say. Great. Um, let me just go on to the next few questions. Um, so the the next question, John, is also for you, just the last question about how how large did your sample size need to be in order to use propensity score matching in this case?
John? Okay, I keep pressing mute. Apologies. <laughs> uh, in this case, we only um, used it in one of the five countries where we were doing the impact evaluation, um, and somewhat purposefully because we thought if we were able to say something about um, you know, a comparison group in one of the countries that would help us at least have, um, uh, we couldn't afford to do it, you know, to be frank, in all of them. So uh, we picked one that we thought was indicative enough. Uh, in this case, the comparison group, we had 200 youth um, uh, compared to 100 youth that were in the program. Um, so oftentimes to get a good match, um, you know, somewhere in the range of, um, you know, twice as many, uh, within a comparison group, um, I've seen people, you know, talk about the four or five times as many. So it, it can be cumbersome uh, on that front. Great. Thank you. Um, Celeste, the, the next questions are for you. Um, there were a couple of questions related to, to what else you might have looked at. So beyond the number of latrines built, were there any questions about use? Did use of the latrines increase? Um, another question asked whether you collected information on people's views after having bought and installed the latrines, like levels of satisfactions or areas of confusion. And kind of a related question um, to that is, you know, how do you balance the need to have more information with the cost associated with, um, like, gathering this information? So how many, um, were you ever concerned about having too many indicators for, for monitoring the sanitation projects? Um, those are great questions. Uh, the answer, so regarding the, um, the latrine use, we had some limited questions about use. Um, we did not... Uh, collect a lot of information on sort of the satisfaction, the the interaction with the sanitation markets, and sort of the, the views about um, latrines before and after. I think that's an area where, you know, would have been good to both have focus groups during the project as well as some additional questions um, at the end. Um, if, but your your question about budgeting is is also very, very relevant to the situation because um, a lot of the reasons that we had sort of the limits we did was that we had a very, very small budget for the survey and the evaluation. Um, and so part of that was about having to unfortunately make choices about what we could collect in the final survey. Um, I don't know if, if either of you feel comfortable um, answering this question, but obviously this is a question that comes up often. Um, what, was the, what was the total cost of the project or program and what was the cost for impact evaluation if it was calculated separately from the total cost? Or, or perhaps being able to say like what percentage of the, of the program um, was, was the evaluation cost um, along these lines as well, um, there's a question from someone who's asking or noting that USAID has now set a 3% um, target for program budgets to be dedicated to M&E, and I actually think it's just that 3% only applies to evaluation. Um, but are your organizations setting budgetary targets for M&E, either overall or for specific projects? So I don't know who wants to take either question first. Um, well, I, I don't um, mind answering. Um, in terms of the cost of the project, it was a very small project. I don't, I don't know that I'm in a position to share the exact cost just because that's not, uh, that's not necessary. I wasn't prepared for that question, but it was a, it was a six-figure number. It was very modest, um, and, and our evaluation budget was probably about 2%. Uh, it, was, it was also a very small number, and we were very lucky that we had someone in Ghana who is pursuing a graduate degree and was very interested in research, who was able to spearhead the evaluation at a very uh, reasonable consultant fee. And then we had some kind of project staff resources to carry out the survey. Um, so the survey, I mean, our, our budget for the evaluation, quite frankly, was only a few thousand dollars. It was very limited, and we relied a lot on essentially in-kind resources. Um, in terms of uh, budgetary targets for M&E, uh, we are trying to do that particularly in, our, in the programs that we're currently developing now. 
Um, I, I think that's a reason. I mean, I think that that target is very much a, a rule of thumb kind of figure that can vary pretty widely, particularly when you're trying to do an impact evaluation. I think if you want to do a serious impact evaluation, that, that benchmark is way too low. Okay. John, do you have, um, do you want to take a stab at, at both these questions? I think you might be on mute again. You're absolutely right. <laughs> the the cost of the of the impact evaluation actually was, um, you know, roundabout what we would, um, what would ne what would be required for you know a typical external performance evaluation um, of this program, and I think for us it's um, you know it was a decision to to you know focus less on some of the typical performance evaluation criteria and questions. Um, around relevance and efficiency and some of those things. Did the project achieve you know, its objectives? Because um, we already had a kind of a good sense of that uh, from previous studies. So it was, it was more of a, of a decision to, to channel that into more of, a, of, a, of an impact evaluation design. So cost-wise, um, fairly, fairly equal. Uh, in terms of targets, um, I think in our guidance, we, we had, you know, we put out 5%. Um, to, to shoot for, to, to carve out in, in programs, um, and of course, you know, we often fall short. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, the next question is for um, Celeste. So, Celeste, how do you tailor the, and, and I guess, John, actually, if you have things to contribute here as well, you can. Um, how do you tailor the questions to the local language or cultures? So many words don't make sense in other languages, and sometimes we have to provide examples to illustrate what we want to ask, since the client isn't exposed to our language and concepts. How do you tailor the questions where there are more than one predominant language um, spoken in the town? Do you have any examples you could share in this regard? Um, so I. I don't have a good example for this project. I think, um, to be honest, so at Africare, I mean, well over 90% of our staff is, actually, is African, and our country offices are staffed almost exclusively locally. So we're really lucky that we have a, that typically um, addressing language issues is an area where we have a lot of good resources in our program staff to do that. And so when we develop questionnaires, we usually are able to just draw on the knowledge of our local program staff in terms of how to word things. Um, for this project, I actually um, I don't have an example of where we sort of address kind of a local language issue versus a more, I guess, I don't know, universal English, unfortunately. Um, but we did rely on program staff to look over the questionnaire, both for the baseline and end line, to review for uh, local context. Great. John, did, would you have anything that you'd want to add to this? From the example that I was highlighting before uh, the Youth Civic Engagement Project, it was five countries, so you have that issue for sure. And I remember getting a, you know, a question from the evaluation consulting group about you know, the, the standard to be able to do this well is to translate and then have the back translated into English so that, you know, you're sure that you're, you know, the translation is, is accurate and, and consistent across languages. Um, you know, in this case, like many others for us, you know, that kind of, um, you know, translation, back translation was a bit of a bridge too far. Uh, and it definitely risks having people answering very different questions. Great. Um. Celeste, a couple more questions for you. Um, so the first one is, given that you changed the end line survey to include different indicators, how did you compare that data to the baseline, where I assume you did not have all the same indicators? And then the, the other question um, related to the, the no change, the fact that there was no um, change found in the, the incidence of, of diarrhea. So the question is, what explanation could you attribute to this? How were you able to monitor other interventions on water and sanitation in the, in the program that 
might let you answer this question. And so, um, so yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for the first question, we, we basically just distinguished between which questions were included in both and therefore eligible for comparison in the final assessment versus which were not. And so those were addressed uh, explicitly in a, you know, it was made clear that this was collected only on the end. It's, it's what we're reporting at the end, but it, we're not in a position to compare to the baseline. Um, so just sort of distinguishing between what was in both and what was only in one. Um, the explanation for adducing to the change in diarrhea, you know, I, as I mentioned in the presentation, this was an area where we, we did not have as much context and various kinds of both monitoring and survey data to be able to make a very clear statement on this. Some of the information that we did have um, suggested that um, there were some things, some of the, um, this issue around the, the w not treating water, if it came, this belief among some households that if I get my water from a well, I don't need to treat it. Um, as long as I just go ahead and store it in a container, it's fine. It's, much be it's already much better quality than if I had gotten water from uh, the river or another source. Um, so that was one thing. Um, another thing that um, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of information on, but uh, it did have a, a little bit on that, you know, it might be something that we would maybe look at more closely in the future is that um, there were some issues around that some of the um, some of the behavior change around waste management maybe didn't uh, take as much as other to, I guess sink in as much as other elements of the behavior change campaign. Um, so that's another possibility. Um, I'm not sure what the second question means exactly. How are you able to monitor other interventions on water and sanitation in the program? Um, maybe. Maybe an, another person had phrased it this way. What other components would you add to the evaluation to tell you what you might need to change in such programs if you want to reduce the, the diarrhea prevalence? Um, I th you mean on a program level or on a tracking level? On a tracking level. OK. Um, I think we would have just added more questions uh, around kind of what management of disease prevention and, and what was going on there and then also probably would have looked more closely at um, mothers and sort of what they were doing around this practice. We didn't necessarily uh, also do a lot of intra-household distinguishing in the survey and then therefore weren't in a position to do analysis on some of those roles so we would probably look more closely at that as well. Great. Um, this question, which I might make the last question, is um, for both of you. Um, and, and the question is, do you have any thoughts on how some of your concerns or lessons learned about the methodology might influence your dissemination of the results? So Celeste or John, who wants to go first? Um, I'll take a, a quick stab at it. For us, we had two evaluation. There was the, the secondary data analysis to see if you know if these theories were likely to be um, you know valid in the context of where we're working. So we pulled that together um, and have shared it, um, not to say anything about our programs, but just simply to contribute to some of the you know the thinking around um, what difference civic engagement makes for youth in in the Arab world. Um, so I think it's it's useful, even though it doesn't speak directly to our to our programming. Um, the you know the second phase, which we're still you know pulling together results on, um, I think would be more. Um, you know, we probably need to think harder about it. Um, you know, especially if we found you know positive results along the lines we were hoping for in the program, um, and making sure we we feel you know confident that. Um, in backing them up in terms of the methods. So that, I think that's a little bit to be decided for us. Thanks. Celeste? Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I don't. Um, I, I mean, I guess it 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 definitely sparks some discussions about kind of what you know what the I'm trying to think how to say. It. I think we had some results where we felt like we had really good context um, to sort of uh, go along with it, and other results where you know we didn't have as much information that would pr that we could provide the level of explanation that we wanted to. And so I think definitely being transparent about that is important. Um, I think that's kind of the main the main the main lesson is is sort of you know making sure that to the I mean you're never going to necessarily maybe get all of the context that you want on every single thing but definitely um, we had some differences in terms of the amount of context we had for some of the different outcomes so making sure that the that the limitations are clear when you're sharing the results yeah I think that's really important great um, well I think we've uh, we've covered most of the questions that, that people had, um, so I just want to thank you both again for sharing these experiences um, and, and illustrating a bit on how m and &E can really help improve impact evaluation and um, let you draw better conclusions about what happened and, and also for determining what you might want to look into in more detail during an impact evaluation. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that um, the materials from this webinar as well as the webinars associated, associated with the other guidance notes in the series um, will be on Interaction's website at interaction.org slash impact dash evaluation dash notes. Um, we are currently finalizing the translations for the first guidance note, so thank you for your patience, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get the translations in Spanish, French, and Arabic for the second guidance note up a little bit more quickly. Um, Bert is also also received questions after the his webinar, um, which he's in the process of answering now, and so those uh, answers will be posted on, on Interactions website as well. And I really encourage you to, to check out the um, webinar Q&A from the webinar with Patricia Rogers since she added um, additional resources, links to additional resources in her responses there as well. Um, in terms of, of next steps, if you have questions for our panelists from today, um, here are their emails. Um, second, we really appreciate your feedback on this series, um, and after this webinar ends, you'll receive an email with a, a link to a, a short survey, it's just a few questions, so please do take a few moments to complete that, and there's also room to suggest uh, topics, other topics that might be of interest to you. Um, and then I did want to let you know that the two final notes in the series, again, that's Introduction to Mixed Methods for Impact Evaluation and Use of Impact Evaluation Results, are still being developed. So the next webinars likely won't be until this summer, but I'll make sure that everyone that has participated in the webinars to date um, receives the information on the notes and on the webinars that will accompany them. So with that, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us today and especially to John and Celeste for their presentations. So thanks very much. Thanks, Leah. Thanks. Bye. Bye.